Hey everyone, welcome to the latest On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Welcome back, everybody. It's been uh, a bit um, between, I think the last one was around Remembrance Day. No, I did the AMA. That's right, around the 8th, 7th, 8th, um, the beginning of the Pacific War. So thanks, everybody, for coming back. Uh, it's good to have a good audience to talk about a topic that's really been an interest to me for quite a long time now. Done another live stream on it. I'll link all that stuff down below. There was a video release yesterday. I'll link that out. You can check it all out yesterday. So today I have a guest I'm excited to have on to talk about the, today's topic of Ortona, but looking at that urban warfare specifically and with a specialist in the area. It, it's great to have that, having Jason on, Jason Drew today. Talk about Ortona. I think I know a lot, but I'm sure he knows way more than I do. So as always, as usual, um, drop uh, any comments or comment or sorry any questions or comments sorry i'm also getting over a cold so if i sound weird or i stumble a little bit that's why um so um leave those on the side we'll get to them as we move along um and see as i always do to fit them in the flow but don't be afraid to hold back because i'm sure there's lots of questions and i didn't really tell jason this but i'm gonna have questions that i'm just gonna jump in with too and he'll, he'll answer them so uh, it should be good so hey jason thanks for coming on today i really appreciate it yeah thanks for inviting me brad yeah, no, it's uh, been wanting to have you on to do Ortona, and we've been talking about this for a while, so it just happens to work out, but this is around the anniversary, the beginning of the battle, um, and get to do, especially with the holidays coming up, with some people off now, so they can come and hang out with us while we talk about this. So, as a lot of you people are aware, have been with me since the beginning of these live streams, I always ask these the same kind of way, why this topic, and I know your specialties and everything you do, so, so maybe we could talk about that, why urban warfare, why Ortona, why is that something you're interested in? Well, it uh, began when I was a young uh, platoon commander in Company 2nd Command of 3rd Battalion, the Royal Canadian Regiment, 3 RCR, up at Canadian Forces Base Petawawa. We came back from our operational tour to Bosnia-Herzegovina, and our commanding officer, uh, now retired Major General Dennis Thompson, launched uh, the entire battalion on a year-long operations, urban operations training package. Mm. Because... Uh, uh, General Thompson at the time understood that urban warfare was going to become the warfare of the future. Right. And so we launched us on this year long training program. I think that's what had me that, that that's where I, I got bitten by the bug. And then I was uh, posted to a reserve unit as the regular force cadre uh, operations officer, the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders of Canada, out of okay. Hamilton, Ontario. And there was a young company commander there, an L. Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Hatfield. He's currently the commanding officer of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. He was also interested in doing urban operations. And we did three years of urban operations training. And uh, so for the first few years, it was all the individual skills, the hands and feet, you know, how to clear a room, how to clear a hallway, how to move, a, how, how to move across the street, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and then a few years later, I was posted to the tactics school. And uh, I started to recognize that urban warfare was the present in the future. But, you know, when I had been there as a student at the tactics school, um, they had an urban operations training package. But when I went, when I was posted back to the school many years later as an instructor, I noticed that uh, somebody had taken the urban operations training package completely out of it. Hmm. So I endeavored to put urban operations back in. And luckily we had commandants and other course officers who were interested in urban operations being as part of the training curriculum. And so now I was designing uh, urban operations training packages that were focused on the planning, the tactics and the sustainment at the company battalion brigade division level, which was, oh, wow. you know, everybody thinks that urban operations is about clearing rooms, but it's much right. more than that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's great for have soldiers clearing rooms, but how are you going to get them to that building in the first place? And that's what was missing. And so for the past 20 years now, I've been participating in planning, training, coordinating, executing, instructing, teaching, mentoring uh militaries around the world not just canadian military but uh, american british australian uh many european nations on uh, urban operations and so uh it was funny having done this for almost uh two decades i still knew very little about the urban battle of ortona mm -hmm. and so when i had the opportunity to do my graduate degree at the University of New Brunswick under uh, the amazing Dr. Lee Windsor and his equally amazing wife, Dr. Cindy Brown, who are both subject matter experts on Italy, on Canada and the Italian campaign. Um, I said to Lee, I, I would like to do Ortona for obvious reasons, because that's my passion. And we were able to follow through on that. And, uh, and so that's why that's how I became um, interested in this, in this particular battle. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's kind of almost like a natural evolution in a sense. Yes, very much so. Of getting there. 
Sorry, just responding to a quick comment there. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think it's a lot of similar stories for people who kind of get interested in Ortona. It's uh, I've never heard anybody getting in through Ortona first. It's it's usually they're studying Canada and the Italian campaign, and then they learn about this battle and and things like it's discussed in a lot of ways. I think in a lot of ways very poorly, um, particularly non Canadians. <laughs> seen us get written, <laughs> yeah. seen us get written out completely. Yeah, um, oh yes, very much so. Which is not okay. Um, that really ticked me off, but it, that's how we kind of get to it. So, yeah, you got a you got a PowerPoint for us today to go through. If you want to, yeah, I do. Uh, pull that up, and then I'll bring it up. Yeah, certainly. There you go. Can you see that, Brad? Uh, it's gone. Let me just have to share it again. It was there and it disappeared. Okay. So lovely world of tech. One moment, everyone. There we go. There we are. Are we good now? Now we're good. All right. Perfect. So, so just to move forward here, uh, I'll start off with an introduction, just from the historical aspect, Brad, because I know that you and, and other military historians will appreciate it. When I was researching out this particular battle, I found that uh, most historians, um, all they did was they barfed out a bunch of individual stories about uh, the urban battle of Ortona. So Private Watts' Pickle did this, and Sergeant Watts' Pickle too did that. Yeah. And there was no real flow to the battle. Um, mm. uh, and most historians too, they tended to follow Colonel Nicholson's official history, yeah. where it was the two thirds, one third rule, I called it, where two thirds of, of the Ortona campaign was focused on the Moa River and the Gully. Yeah. And then the last third, the last tired third of whatever book it was, was about the Battle of Ortona itself. And even again, it was just a bunch of individual stories. Right. So when I was doing that kind of, when I was doing that research, I wanted to look at the battle. I know the sultry term is holistically um, mm -hmm. to yeah. do that. I wanted to look at more of the cause and effect and looking at the battle from the, from the company and battalion and brigade level, vice doing the individual soldiers and, uh, and their particular individual stories. Those are certainly important, but it'd been done to death by a number of military historians throughout the whole yeah. process. So, uh, that is what I'm going to focus on here. So yeah, I'll, I'll talk about individuals every once in a while, but for the most part, you're not going to, uh, it's going to be a more holistic look at the battle, if that's all right. Yeah, no, that's, I, sorry, just jumping again right away, but I, I agree with you. Um, that's missing. Uh, yeah. I think that's very much needed. Cool. When I, you know, and when we sit, when in the military, when we write a set of operational orders, usually the first paragraph is situation enemy. So let's talk about the Germans and that's my best accent. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're, Brad, I'm sorry, he's the Germans. That's all you're going to get from me. So, so the Green Devils, the 1st Volkswagen Auger Division, the 1st German Parachute Division, called the Green Devils, allegedly by uh, uh, Winston Churchill himself. Um, so when I talk about, I always like to start at the strategic level, then go down to the operational, go down to the tactical level. So strategic level, we all know that the Apennine Mountains form the middle of Italy there. And for centuries, the runoff from rain and snow forms these deep, beautiful valleys um, that, that go to the Adriatic Sea and the Tyrrhenian Sea. And of course, what the Germans did during uh, the Second World War in Italy is they added to those natural obstacles and natural defenses by building man-made obstacles on top of that. And so there was a number of German defensive lines that were designed to attrit and destroy the Allies as they moved up the Italian boot. And it's the Gustav line that uh, we care for in particular here when it comes to the Battle of Ortona. And it's another, another view of it right there. But uh, Adolf Hitler says to smiling Albert Kesselring, who's in charge of all the German forces in Italy, that we ha that they have to stop the Allies at the Gustav line, largely because they can't let, the Germans can't let the Allies take Rome. That would be a huge psychological yeah. and symbolic victory for the Allies, and as equally a huge psychological and symbolic loss for the Germans. Um, and so where that plays down at the operational level is that the British 8th Army believed that the Gustav line, which starts on the west side of Italy and goes over to the east side, uh, they believe that the Gustav line ended at the Ariely River that's just northwest of Ortona that you can see circled there. And um, the Germans don't want to allow the Allies to get through the Gustav line because if the Canadians and the Brits are able to get up to the town of Pescara, uh, which is just northwest of Ortona, well, there's a road that leads from Pescara through the mountain passes and into the back door of Rome. So yeah. for the Germans on the eastern front, they can't let, on the eastern side of Italy, I should say, they can't let the Allies uh, through there. What the what British Eighth Army intelligence didn't know was that Ortona and Villa Grande for the Indians are really the eastern anchor points of the Gustav Line. Um, it was natural for them to think for the uh, for the Allies to think this yep. um, because throughout the Sicilian Italian campaigns, 
Um, the Germans would hold a city or a town for 20, 40, 48 hours. Um, and then they would draw back to the, to the next natural obstacle, the next valley where they had built uh, man-made obstacles on top of it and then fight the battles there. So it, it was natural for the British Eighth Army our intelligence to think this, when in reality, though, it turns out that Ortona is the eastern anchor point of the Gustav line itself. So that's at the operation level. And then going down to the tactical level, you have the German Wehrmacht, who's in Ortona, it's in September 1943, and they're building up the defenses of the town. There's the port. Initially, the Allies don't want to bomb the town with close air support because they need, because as we know, Brad, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. Yeah. And so uh, they don't want to bomb the town because they, they're afraid they're going to damage the port. The Germans destroy the port anyway, and it's too small for the, for the Allies to use in retrospect. But <clears throat> anyway, the port is destroyed by the Germans. And then the Germans, their defensive plan, their scheme and maneuver is in, it's, it's funny because what is, what is doctrine? Doctrine is just common sense written down in long, boring, monotonous publications. But uh, the Germans are actually practicing what is modern urban operations doctrine. So they have a perimeter force battle at the south end of the town. And this is where they're going to lure the Canadians in and attrit some of the uh, Canadian units that are going to fight. And then they're going to do a disruption force battle in which they're going to attrit more of the Canadians. They're going to lure them up Highway 16. They're going to rubble the secondary streets so that the Canadians are invitingly brought up Highway 16 into the center of the town, and then they're going to have a main defensive battle at the various piazze within the town itself. And then, so the various piazze there, the squares, this is where the main killing zones are, and this is where the Germans are going to halt the Canadians. Now, the German Wehrmacht are there from September 1943 to mid December 1943, and then the first Fallschirmjager division is uh, brought in to take over uh, to continue shoring up the defenses of the town in mid December. And you can see there when it comes to the rubbling program, Charles Comfort, you know, Charles Comfort, Brad, very well known Canadian war artist. Um, you can see uh, Charles Comfort's painting there on the rubble on the street, how, how, how thin these secondary streets are and the, the amount of rubble that's on them there. So it's an extensive rubbling program, destroying entire buildings to have them fall into the streets, et cetera, et cetera. So now we have the Red Patch Devils, and Brad, you have to forgive me, but you know there's a delicious irony for historians that the Green Devils are fighting the Red Patch Devils <laughs> um, within the urban hell that's going to be Artona, yeah. right? So you have um, the First Canadian Infantry Division, of course, it fights through Sicily, and then it's and then it 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 does fight through Southern Italy in a lot of minor actions, but then it's really thrown into the fight uh, just southwest. It's thrown back into the front line just southwest of Artona. Mm -hmm. um, and fighting at the Mole River in the Gully. And I'm not going to talk about that, Brad, because your video the other day that I watched that you retweeted that you made last August, I watched that and you know, you've talked about that rather extensively as are most historians. And because I'm an urban warfare historian, um, I'll talk about the urban battle more. In all yeah, of course. No, yeah. That, that, all right. That's so <clears throat> first um, Canadian Infantry Division made about the first Canadian Infantry Brigade, the second Canadian Infantry Brigade, and the third Canadian Infantry Brigade. First and third brigades do a lot of the fighting at the Moa River in the gully. Yeah. That leaves the second Canadian Infantry Brigade, although they did they did do some fighting that's largely untouched, the first and the third take a real pounding at the Moa River in the gully, largely because of, of course, General Chris Vokes is often criticized by historians, as you know, Brad, about his handling of the division at the Moa River in the gully. So General Vokes turns to uh, Brigadier Bert Hoffmeister, former company commander of the Sea Force, former CO of the Sea Force, and now the brigade commander, and says, Bert, Hoffy, you're going to be taking 2nd Brigade into Artona. Don't worry, though, British 8th Army Intelligence says that uh, they're only going to be there for 24 to 48 hours, like they have been through the whole entire Sicily and Italian campaign. <laughs> so you're going to give them a bloody nose, and then they're going to pull back to the Ariely River where the Gustav line is, and that's where we'll have the main fight. So <clears throat> Hoffy turns to uh, Colonel Jim Jefferson of the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, the Loyal Eddies, out of Edmonton, Alberta, obviously, and says, uh, Jim, you're going to go right up Highway 16. Uh, give the Germans a bloody nose. They'll pull out within 24 to 48 hours, and you're, and back you go. He turns to Major Sid Thompson, CEO of the Sea Force, commanding officer of the Sea Force. says, Sid, you're going to be my right flank protection. Um, you're not going to get involved in this fight at all yet. Um, we're just going to see what happens with the Loyal Eddies. And then he also turns to Lieutenant Colonel Cammy Ware, of the Patricias and goes, Patricias are my brigade reserve. Now, yeah, the second brigade is largely a Western Canada brigade, but you can see there's other enablers that are going to help out the brigade. You have uh, squadrons from the 12th Canadian Armed Regiment, Three Rivers Regiment from Trois Rivières, Quebec. You have Royal Canadian Engineers, 4th Field Company, and then you have the 90th Anti Tank Battery from the Royal Canadian Artillery, and they're from New Brunswick. So it is a cross Canada brigade, mm -hmm. like all the brigades really are. 
yeah. when it comes to uh, this particular fight. Uh, can Keep I ask just real quick there? Because we had a really good question. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, about the port. Because, again, it, it comes up. I actually found some really interesting footage of it yesterday. It's just very short. I don't know what I can even do with it. Uh, of a 25 pounder basically firing on Artona. And you can see the port. Um, about questions of what they believed in terms of, of the port and the destruction. They think it was going to be, again, they just hold for a day or two and that's not enough time to do a lot of extensive damage to the port or are they just, you know, wishful thinking that the port would be intact like we see sometimes later in Northwest Europe. Yeah, they were really hoping the port would be intact. But, uh, you know, again, the Germans have been there since September 1943 and so they made sure they destroyed the port facilities whatsoever. And in retrospect, too, the port was way too small. It's tiny. Um, yeah, it's tiny. I mean, if you look at Ortona now, the port is considerably larger. Yes. Uh, but back then, it was considerably small. And Dr. Windsor, my thesis advisor for this, he's, he's been to Ortona, and he's like, uh, you know, he's seen the port, and it's like, you, you wouldn't even be able to get an LST, a landing ship yeah. tank into that thing uh, back in 1943. I think he was probably exaggerating a bit, but um, yeah, it well, was way too small. I, so. uh, as you can imagine, and looking at the videos and things, uh, I've seen quite a number of of footage and, and and photos there's so many photos of the port and i think yeah. that's probably part of the reason because they were like hey we can use it and they get there and they go oh this wasn't good yeah that's <laughs> um, right i've just seen so many photos of the port and it just because it becomes almost the non-factor right so it's mm -hmm. why is there so much attention to it and i think that's why yeah and of course it's a main reason why the, the allies don't bother using close air support to bomb the town either yeah. right which becomes another fact afterwards the canadians are like we should have just bombed the town but of course that's easy to say in retrospect yeah of course sorry yeah no worries so in, in the military, of course, we always we always analyze the terrain that we're going to fight on. So north is at the top of the map. This map, of course, comes from Mark Zulke's book, Ortona. So that's where I'm, I'm using it from. And I've just taken PowerPoint and amended it a bit. So north is at the top of the map. So Ortona split into Old Town and New Town. Old Town, where all the buildings are very much closer together. They stand literally shoulder to shoulder, and they're about three to four stories high. New Town is where the buildings are very separated from each other and there's larger alleys and secondary streets and that's important for the fighting later on um this is a very modern photo of ortona when i was commanding the counter improvised explosive devices cell at the tactics school i had a geomatics technician working for me they got some great google earth programs their own version of google earth and so you can see ortona now you can see old town where all the buildings are standing shoulder to shoulder and then new town where the buildings are all very much separated Ortona stands on a ravine. It sits on a ravine. So a correction, it's, it sits on a plateau, I should say. There's a large ravine to the west, about 50 meters to 75 meters in length. And then there's a large cliff to the east. And then there's another large ditch or fossil up to the north. <clears throat> and when uh, when you look at, I go back to my geomatics technicians programs, you can see here that uh, the red arrows in the blue line actually simulates the cross section of mm -hmm. Ortona and as you go from north to south you can see the large ravine to the left the cliffs and the ocean to the east all the way from north to south and what that means what that means of course is that you can't flank this town you can't come in from the west mm -hmm. because it's impossible to climb the ravine and you can't come in from the east because of the Adriatic and because of the, the large cliffs so you have to attack this city uh, uphill from the south it's either that you got to work your way all the way to the north and come in from the north and the Germans know that. So the Germans are obviously going to uh, take advantage of the fact that this town is on top of a plateau and that you can't. And another good reason why it serves as a good anchor point, too, for the Gustav line defense. And of course, you have the Adriatic to the east and the north. <clears throat> These are the various streets. I want to point out Corso Bianchi, Corso Vittorio Emanuele, and the Via Tripoli. This is Highway 16. If you go to Ortona now, Highway 16 is west of the town. But back then, Highway 16 ran through the town, and it was the first Canadian Infantry Division's and the 8th Army's main logistical route as it was working its way up eastern Italy. And so another reason why we have to take the town is because we need this Highway 16 open to bring up all the bullets and the beans. <clears throat> Again, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. So all the roads you see in red are the ones that the loyal ladies are going to fight on. All the ones you see in yellow are where the sea forts are going to fight on. <clears throat> the Piazze, these are the killing zones that the Germans have formed. Again, they're going to put any tank guns, snipers, marksmanship, machine guns, and grenadiers all around the Piazze. Uh, and they're going to, that's how, and it's the, it's these Piazze at the north end of the town. Piazza San Tommaso, Plebiscita, Municipale, and Piazza San Francesco. And it's called Dead Horse Square by the Sea Force, and I'll get into that uh, later on. 
but it's those piazza in particular that that's the main defensive area and that's where the germans are going to stop the canadians for sure prominent buildings going from south to north the pensione i'll tell re, i'll give you the reason why it's called johnson's house later on church of santa maria to constantinople the cathedral piazza san francesco and the cathedrale santa massa are three large prominent churches within the town and then you've got another series of buildings there the, the castle at the north end doesn't have an effect on this battle at all but i just want to point it out that it's the north end of the town all right and then there's a railway railways and railway tunnel the tunnel acts as an area for the germans to seek shelter and to put their reinforcements and their resupply and so that's going to affect the battle as well because the canadians don't have the luxury of, of uh, finding shelter like the Germans do at the end of the day. <clears throat> so the tunnel plays a part in this battle for the Germans and gives the, gives a bit of an advantage to the Germans as a result. All right, Theo Tonesi, Brad, when I watched your video the other day, I was very, very happy that you talked about the civilians in, in the town, the Ortonesi, because throughout my urban warfare historical research, uh, I found that about 10% of the civilians will stay in a town yeah. even though they know an urban violent storm is going to descend upon them it's because they have nowhere to go they want to protect their families by hiding in the basements or they want to protect their personal possessions yeah sorry just to give you a break there um because again i got a question but i want to speak on that because i think that's important um generally speaking but also for ortona and again i think maybe that's going to be one of our themes today is you know what gets the focus what doesn't or you know for whatever reason uh, but the civilians in this particularly it's fascinating because the things I've read or from the various, various projects that are available online from oral histories, the, the, the guys who fought there, the guys who were in this fight, the Canadians, mentioned the civilians quite often. Yeah. They talk about because they interacted with some of them, right? Yeah. Some of them, they, they spoke English. They spoke to each other. It's, it, they're like, why are you here? That's exactly what you just said. They're like, we have nowhere to go. Yeah. Um, but it's also <clears throat> that's such a huge part of what they remember. And yet it doesn't make its way into the books, which yeah. is a big is a big mistake, in my opinion. Yeah, very much so. And um, the Germans were actually able to evict uh, out of the 10 population of 10,000 or Tonesi, the Germans evicted about 9,000 of them. And there was somewhere about 1,000 to 1,500 still left in the town when the yeah. battle occurred. So the Germans even said, look, if we find you in this town, we're going to assume you're a spy and we'll execute you on the spot. But even they, some of the civilians even assumed that risk and still stayed in the town, yeah. uh, which is why when I'm teaching urban operations to my students, I'm like, you have to have a proactive plan to safely transport civilians out and to feed them and water them and, and shelter them yeah. until the non-government organizations show up. Um, because we're the good guys and that's what we do but unfortunately the canadians didn't because this is going to be the first extensive urban operations battle of the italian campaign the canadians didn't have that in play in place and so you're going to see that italian civilians the ortonesi really suffer for that later on as yeah. the two sides really start upping the violence in this particular urban battle yeah uh, we won't take a health break but um there's a photo <laughs> of ortona just before the battle there yeah so that was actually going to be the question because it's been asked a couple times i can't find them but it, it's been there so maybe expand on it a little bit they're asking about was there photo reconnaissance yes i know there was was it used extensively was there even time to use it extensively there was reconnaissance but it was um it was only done at battalion level and the and so the right. battalion sent their scout platoon commanders forward yeah. to try to find breaks in the line and um or sometimes company commanders went forward um, with the scout platoon commanders. Like for example, Loyal Eddie's Big Jim Stone, who was the officer commanding D Company actually went forward one time to see if he could find anything. But the Germans, once again, remember the Germans are planning to do a defense and they want to lure the Canadians in. So the reconnaissance didn't come up with much, uh, largely because the Germans were in hiding and they wanted to lure the Canadians into this urban area to destroy them. They didn't want to show their cards uh, too early in the fight. So. Uh, reconnaissance wasn't everybody just assumed british eighth army intelligence was right uh, 24 to 48 hours and then they'll pull back so there wasn't much reconnaissance done in all honesty and whatever reconnaissance did they didn't find much in, in, in uh, to begin with yeah which makes perfect sense yeah <clears throat> all right so on the 20th i'll quickly do a day by day and again there's so much detail us brad i could talk about this for two hours but obviously <laughs> you don't have that time so i'll try to go day by day and as quickly as i can yeah, of course. So on the 20th, you see the Loyal Eddies, remember, they're their main effort. So they're coming up Highway 16. Lieutenant Melvin is a troop commander. He's a tank commander with a troop of tanks, four tanks. <clears throat> He's right on Highway 16, coming up with the Loyal Eddies. They're approaching D Company on the left side of the highway, B Company on the right side of the highway. 
50 pounds of TNT, blow up Lieutenant Melvin's tank, flip the tank over, kill the crew. The rest of the tanks go off the Highway 16 and they get mired down in a in a minefield. And that pretty much stops the Little Ladies cold as they advance towards Ortona. The C Force on the right side, remember, they're not the main effort. And what's going to happen here is C Company's on the right, D Company's on the left, sandwiched in between C Company and the Loyal Eddies. D Company's going to move up to a higher precipice, and they're going to try to fire C Company into uh, up to a precipice with four machine gun nests. C Company uses a creeping barrage to advance and pass over those four German machine gun nests, and then D Company fires them in. And even though C Company and the C Force had the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople as their objective that day, um, after the creeping barrage and the and the fight and the destruction of those four machine gun nests at the precipice, um, they fall with 300 meters short of the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople. And that's basically the 20th. On the 21st, this is where they, in urban operations doctrine, they, the loyal ladies and the sea force are going to break in and gain lodgment. At first, at 7 o'clock in the morning, the Cathedral de San Tommaso is blown up by the Germans at 7 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and what they've done is they've they've rigged the building with explosives, and you can see it's, it looks like it's been cleaved in half. Yeah. There's a church by a Charles, there's a, a painting by Charles Comfort and a photo of it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And this was particularly this uh, hurtful to the to the Ortonesi because the 21st of December is the Feast of San Tommaso when they actually celebrate St. Thomas. And so for the Germans to blow up the church on this day was was particularly insulting. But anyway, um, there's a conspiracy theory out there that it was Canadian artillery that did this. Canadian yeah. artillery can't do that to a building. That's mm -hmm. only en engineers can do that to a building if they if they if they place the proper shape charges to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a constant one, and I, I'm not really sure why. But it's, yeah, I've, I've I don't know why either. either. Like yeah. that would have been very impressive for for artillery to do that to a building yeah. that size. So anyway, I'll go with the Loyal Ladies first in the order of march, and then I'll do the C4 second. So Loyal Ladies, B Company on the right side of the highway gets in and breaks in and gain lodgment to Ortona. D Company with Big Jim Stone on the left, not not so lucky. Jim Stone does, does two frontal attacks. He whittles his company down from 90 to 30 troops. He's going to do, he wants to go in behind B Company. And Colonel Jefferson says, no, we got to keep Highway 16 open. So Jim Stone's not too happy. He's going to do a third frontal attack when his, one of his platoon commanders says, sir, it's James Dugan, his platoon commander says, sir, I'm going to take a, 10 of your guys and we're going to, we're going to infiltrate in behind the Pensioni and we're going to come in and attack the Germans from behind. And he's able to do that successfully. And then they're able to, D Company is able to break in and gain lodgment. They take some German prisoners and they get the hand the prisoners over to Lieutenant Alan Johnson, the scout commander. And that's why the Pensioni becomes out of Johnson's house. Meanwhile, the sea force on the right, C Company spends the morning clearing out the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople. It's about a, about a four hour battle, <clears throat> but they do that very, uh, quite successfully. In the afternoon, Jim Jefferson keeps pushing his loyal ladies forward. Hoffey, recognizing that he's got a bit of a tough fight, gives him a company from uh, the Sea Force to act as left flank protection. So Sid Thompson, under Hoppy's orders, gives D Company to the Loyal Eddies. So as the Loyal Eddies, they continue clearing up Highway 16, which is now Corso Bianchi. And they're thrusting in, in urban operations doctrine, they're doing a thrust, which means they're clearing buildings as they're moving from point A to point B to point Z. And they, they spend the rest of the afternoon and the evening doing that, getting up to Piazza Vittoria. The Sea Force on the right, now that they have the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinopoli, Sid Thompson moves the rest of the battalion up to the church and he pushes C Company out to act as like an early warning just in case the Germans uh, do anything silly like a counterattack or anything of the such. And that ends the day on the 21st. Now, throughout this entire time, you have the tanks from the Three Rivers Regiment supporting them. You have the Royal Canadian Engineers supporting them. And you have Major Tiger Welsh's 90th Andy Tank Battery supporting them. There's lots of rubble piles on the secondary streets, but <clears throat> Tiger Welsh, which I think is the coolest name ever, by the way, <laughs> Tiger Welsh from the 9th and 8th tank battery, he's got, you know, I know the German paratroopers don't have tanks, but why have the guns sit idle? So he brings up his six pounder anti tank guns. He co-locates them with the Loyal Eddies six pounders, and they start blowing away the rubble piles and start destroying defensive positions um, that are covering the rubble piles. So it's a great use of anti tank guns and tanks to blow away the rubble piles, which are also sewn with booby traps and improvised explosive devices. Yeah. And that's a great way of, of lowering those rubble piles and getting rid of the booby traps. 
And so those anti-tank guns are cr quite critical to the battle. Same with the tankers. Yep. So we see here the Loyal Eddies on the top moving through one of the secondary streets. And then you can see the damage later on, on the 23rd of December, some of the damage that's occurred on the same street as a uh, German Fallschirmjager are bringing brought back as uh, prisoners of war. Okay. The 22nd of December, the loyal eddies are going to continue fighting. What's happening is they bring up four tanks and they're any tank guns, the South side of Piazza Vittoria, and they start blasting away German positions around Piazza Vittoria. And it, they take most of the morning to clear that piazza. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Sid Thompson still has D Company supporting the Loyal Eddies by protecting the left flank by going up via Rapino a bit. That's this uh, small little jut right there. <clears throat> and then meanwhile, throughout most of the day, most of the sea force are inside the church of Santa Maria to Constantinople, and it's taken mortar rounds from somewhere. And finally, there's a sea force observation post that finally spots the uh, German mortar team that's bombing the church and they're able to scatter them with Canadian artillery, but not before the Germans destroy an ammunition truck and the intelligence officer's Jeep uh, just outside of the Church of Santa Maria to Constantinople. And Sid Thompson, and very daring for a commanding officer, he actually, his own Jeep was parked right beside these two vehicles. He actually gets out, gets into his Jeep and drives his own Jeep away. But uh, very daring for a commanding officer to do that, if you ask me. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Hoffy tells uh, Sid Thompson, uh, Sid, I need you to move your battalion up to Piazza Vittoria, uh, just in case things start to get a little uh, start to get a little hairy with the Loyal Eddies. Now, the Loyal Eddies are able to get to the other side of Piazza Vittoria. Remember, they've been doing thrusting; they've been clearing buildings en route. So, at this point, Big Jim Stone, the officer commanding D Company, is he's like, you know what? I've been losing casualties like crazy. I've been creating, I've been getting casualties like crazy. I don't want to clear buildings anymore. What I just want to do is I just want to drive my tanks from the Three Rivers Regiment up the streets with my engineers and bypass all these buildings and get up to Piazza Municipale. So he asked Jim Jefferson for that permission to do that. Jim Jefferson's like, go, Jim, go ahead and do it. And he does exactly that. He, he has the tanks blare their sirens as loud as possible. And with his engineers and infantry leading the way, he, they bypass all the buildings along the Corso Vittorio Emanuele all the way up to Piazza Municipale. And they run into this huge rubble pile. It's got to be about 20 feet high. It's got improvised explosive devices and booby traps in it too. And so <clears throat> the tanks stop and Jim Stone runs up and he goes, why you stop? Keep going. And one of the, one of the tankers says, I think there's a, a landmine under that sheet, that piece of sheet metal right there. And I don't want to go any further. And Jim Stone is livid. He's like cursing at the tank commander. He's like, you got to keep going or else the Germans are going to start open firing on us. We've seemed to have gained some momentum here. And the tank commander's like, no way. My tank costs $20,000. There's no way I'm going to do that. And Jim Stone's like, every infantry soldier I got is worth a million dollars a piece. At this point, the Germans realize the Canadians have stopped and they start firing at the loyal ladies and they start breaking in with their engineers, start breaking into the buildings. The engineers are actually critical at this point because the tank commander was right there was a bunch of landmines in front of the rubble pile and so one of the engineers um uh he actually runs out and he throws a smoke grenade out to create so the germans can't see him and he and his engineers run out and they actually start uh, hucking the landmines out of the way picking up the landmines and, and throwing them out of the way so that uh they can try to get into the piazza municipality they have to throw a couple smoke grenades to do this but it's sergeant george campion who ends up doing this and winning the military medal um, for doing it as well. But at this particular point, once the evening stops, once the evening comes around, this is as far as the loyal ladies have got. So uh, this is Piazza Vittoria. It's now uh, the Piazza. Uh, oh, I, I, I can't remember the modern name for it now. My apologies. But this is Piazza Vittoria looking from the northeast corner, looking west down the Via Rapino. This building actually still exists in Ortona itself. So if you go on Google Maps, you can actually see it. So this tank is is pointing its its cannon north up. So north is on the right side of this map here, up the course of Vittorio Emanuele. And this tank is looking down the Via Rapino to the west. <clears throat> there was a Canadian arm, uh, Army film and photography unit, which is why you get so many great videos and photos out of this particular battle. And so here they are. Sergeant Johnny Marchand was one of the Three Rivers Regiment tankers that was uh, shot by a marksman. And so here you see uh, Sergeant Johnny Marchand receiving his triage. 
<clears throat> but um, this is after they'd ke- uh, cleared Piazza Vittoria. The loyal ladies have already made their way up course of Vittorio Emanuele. And D Company from the Sea Forest are on the far side of that photo um, down the Via Rapino, just watching the left flank. <clears throat> Here's the course of Vittorio Emanuele. You can see we're now we're into Old Town because all the buildings are stuck three to four stories high and they're standing shoulder to shoulder. So you see engineers, infantry, lads from the loyal ladies, and uh, Sherman tanks from the Three Rivers Regiment. There's video of this too, which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Cool. So that's the 22nd of December. Okay, so it's in the evening of the 22nd when uh, General Chris Vokes, uh, the commander of 1st Canadian Infantry Division, and uh, Hoffy, as commander of 2nd Brigade, realize, oh my God, the Gustav Line is impacted by the Ariely. Ortona is the eastern anchor point of the Gustav Line. So, <clears throat> so what happens is, remember, this is what everybody thought originally, yep. and this is the reality. This is the Gustav Line. So... General Volk says, right, I'm going to throw 1st Brigade and 3rd Brigade up the west side of the ravine and try to get to the north end of the town. And Hoffie, I want you to continue fighting a 2 Brigade within the town. Hoffie realizes, too, <clears throat> that um, he's got to commit more resources to the fight. So he goes into town. There's Sid Thompson on the right there of the Seal of the Sea Force. And he goes, Sid, I got good news and bad news. Good news is I'm promoting you to Lieutenant Colonel. The bad news is, is that um, Ortona is the eastern anchor point of the Gustav line, and I need to commit you to this particular fight. What I want you to do, Sid, is I want you to take the Sea Force off to the west side of the town, turn northeast, and I want you to link up with the loyal ladies at the north end of the town and clear the west side of the town. I'm going to give you more resources. I'll give you more tanks. I'll give you more anti tank guns <clears throat> and more artillery. Um, you and Jim Jefferson, the loyal ladies, and you guys got to fight this fight. So on the 23rd of December, that's exactly what happens. You can see the Sea Force now are moving slowly and surely down the Via Rapino and up the secondary streets towards Piazza San Francesco. <clears throat> the lo- Loyal Eddies are able, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the tanks and the anti-tank guns uh, practice their uh, ability to be early morning alarm clocks, and they start blowing down that huge rubble pile. And then they get the tanks and the anti-tank guns into Piazza Municipale, and the Loyal Eddies start fighting in and around it. But it's at this particular point in the battle where Bill Longhurst uh, makes a smart tactical move. Remember, all the buildings are standing shoulder to shoulder. And so he says, you know what? We've been going in. When we were fighting in, in Newtown, all the buildings were separated, so we had no choice. We had to fight. We had to enter the buildings from the doors and the windows on the main floor and fight bottom up. But now we're in Old Town, where all the buildings are standing shoulder to shoulder. So I can take my engineers and my infantry pioneers. Once we've cleared a building, we can just walk right back up to the top and then blow holes on the top floor to top floor and then fight down. And that takes the initiative away from the Germans and we can throw our grenades down the stairs and it's a lot easier fighting top down than, than bottom up. And because all the buildings are standing shoulder to shoulder, once we clear a building, we can just walk right back up to the top and do it all over again. And so Bill Longhurst does exactly that. And Brad, what I really liked the other day on your video there is how you said how the Canadians did not invent mouse holding and that is very correct. Um, mouse holing has been throughout urban warfare history for decades, long before, even throughout the 19th century, there was mouse holing occurring. Yep. But it was just a common sense thing for the Canadians to do here, especially now that they're in the north end of the town where all the buildings are shoulder to shoulder. And of course, the Sea Force hear about this as well. And so they start doing it down towards Piazza San Francesco. But I'm very much appreciative, Brad, that you said that in your video the other day because it's very much true. Yeah, sorry, just jump because it came up. I don't remember usually Twitter these discussions. That came up maybe last year around the anniversary, and and it's just someone pointed out it's in a manual from thirty six, thirty four, one of the British Army manuals in the, in the mid thirties. So that then and there is proof that it doesn't because those these things were shared. How much they were used by the Canadian Army at the time, yeah. uh, but it has historical precedents, like you already said. It, it's oh, not yeah. new thing like to blow a hole into something to get into it is not yeah, that's right. is not new yeah and the british doctrine actually called it the vertical technique that's what the british doctrine called yep. it uh, where you, you use a pickaxe or a sledgehammer or explosives to go in through the roof or the top floor of a building and and fight your way down yeah what were they uh what were they using just what they had on hand or was there anything specific that they were using to do this they're using 808 plastic explosive they're also using land uh german anti-tank uh, teller landmines that the germans had left behind and they're, other, they're using um, their own organic explosives that they had within 
Um, the engineers got very, very creative with their explosive devices uh, throughout this particular battle. So they were using anything and everything they could find, both Canadian and German. Perfect. In order to do the mouse holes. It wasn't exactly scientific demolitions. Like there was mm -hmm. one time where the Loyal Eddy, I think it was a Loyal Eddy or a C4, I can't remember, where the, engine, the engineers blew the building and the, and the platoon commander was angry because he wanted to take the building and the and the sergeant replied, we're not exactly practicing scientific demolitions here. <laughs> but anyway, Loyal Eddies are split into three at Piazza Municipale. They got D Company moving up to Piazza Plebiscita. They got A Company moving towards Piazza Santa, Ma uh, Piazza Santa Maso and B Company moving towards Corso Umberto. It splits three ways. And so Jim Jefferson had to split the Loyal Eddies three ways yeah. <clears throat> as a result of that. Another thing that occurs here is that, remember how I said Hoffy was going to give additional resources to the fight? So he sets up two 17-pounder anti-tank guns and three Three Rivers Regiment headquarters tanks down to the southeast, about 1,500 yards away, and they start blasting away at the northeast corner of Rotona at the German defenses, which the loyal ladies really appreciate because it means by the time they get there, they won't have to fight through them. Mm -hmm. So once again, you can see the violence is starting to get really... Uh, increased as the Canadians are advancing north because of how stubborn the, the German defenses are. So those, there's a 17-pounder anti-tank gun to the bottom right. That's just a generic photo from the war. That's not necessarily at Rotona, but that's a, you can see how sizable those are. Mm -hmm. All right. There's the Corso Umberto after the Canadians were done with it. Uh, another great painting by Charles Comfort showing the destruction on the, on the northeast corner of the town from those 17-pounders and the Three Rivers Regiment tanks just blasting away. Okay, the 24th of December, <clears throat> the uh, the Loyal Ladies are still fighting through Mi Piazza Municipale. And the reason being is that, remember, there's always a cause and effect that occurs. So on the, the evening of the 22nd, Hoffie and Volks have realized they got to commit more resources to the fight. And so the 23rd sees the Sea Force thrown into the battle, more 17-pounder and tank guns, more 6-pounder and tank guns, more artillery. So the Germans respond in kind. The second battalion of the third parachute regiment, which had been fighting this battle, is now reinforced with the second battalion of the fourth parachute regiment. And not only that, but Adolf Hitler has decreed that the Rotona will be held at all costs. Yep. And not only that, but remember the Canadians have reached the main defensive area, the Piazza at the north end of the town. And this is where the Germans are determined to halt the Canadians. So as the Canadians increase the violence and increase the resources, the Germans do the exact same. And so this is why the loyal ladies have a real tough fight up by the Piazza Municipale and why the Sea Force are having a tough fight <clears throat> at uh, at Piazza San Francisco. When they get there, June Thomas is the officer commanding A Company, the Sea Force, and he's he looks in and he's and he sees a dead horse in the middle of the square, and he's like, "Oh!" And he radios back to Sid Thompson that they reached Dead Horse Square, <clears throat> and that's why Piazza San Francisco is called Dead Horse Square for the remainder of the battle. Yep. <clears throat> the Sea Force are lured. There's a section that's lured into the school. That's within the uh, within the uh, square, and they take the building really easily, almost too easily. And then a few minutes later, the building bl is blown. It turns out the Germans had wired the building, and what they did is they put up a token resistance. When the C4 section got into the building, they blew the building, and an entire section was almost killed. So that's uh, Piazza San Francesco up on the left in the left corner there. Ignore the numbers and the letters. That's from June Thomas when he was discussing how they took their initial break-in and gaining entry into the into the squares. <clears throat> so, and there's the dead horse there at the, in the bottom right corner. That comes from the British Defense Film, the Pr British Film Defense League's um, documentary on this particular battle, but that's why it's called Dead Horse Square. And so one soldier from that section, Private Gordon Curry Smith, if, if survives survives the, um, the, the building imploding on the section, and he's under that rubble for three days. And the Sea Force can't get to him because as soon as the Sea Force run out there to try to lift all the rubble away, the Germans, of course, open fire on them. Twenty <clears> fifth <throat> of December, the violence is not going to be, uh, is not going to abate at all. And uh, what happens is uh, both sides are going to celebrate Christmas dinner. And what happens is the the, the company quartermaster Storman from the Loyal Eddies are able to bring up some cold pork chops. <clears throat> and um, and some other foods, and the most important thing, of course, cigarettes and beer, and bring it up. And some of the loyal ladies are able to suck back 100 meters and then, you know, scarf down the, the, the cold pork chops and have a beer or cigarette and then get back into the fight. But there's not much effort to, to really clear the Piazza Municipality, and it's Christmas Day as well. Like, nobody wants to die on Christmas Day. 
<clears throat> the Sea Force out in the out on the west side of the town, do of course with a little more style. Captain DB Cameron, a couple days before, he's he's gone to Sid Thompson and he's like, you know, can we maybe we can do a Christmas dinner or something? And Sid Thompson assumes the risk and he's like, okay, we're going to pull a company back to the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople and have a Christmas dinner. One company at a time will come back and then it'll do a relief in place of another company. Each company comes back for two hours. So Captain D.B. Cameron and his quartermaster staff scour the countryside where they beg, borrow, and <clears throat> quote, borrow, unquote, um, all kinds of food. And um, like, listen to this, soup, roast pork, vegetables, <clears throat> mixed potatoes, gravy, pudding, mince pies, chocolate nuts, fresh fruit, <clears throat> and the most important thing, cigarettes and beer. Mm -hmm. And they actually have a dinner <clears throat> back at, at the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople. <clears throat> and there's some debate as to who this photo was, but you can see Karen Storwick yeah. of the Military Museums of Calgary actually figured it out that it is uh, the Sea Force outside of it, outside of the church in an oratory. But meanwhile, what's happening? <clears throat> what's happening up at um, up at uh, Dead Horse Square is the, the fighting is still going on. <clears throat> the, the the Three Rivers Regiment is still able to bring up more tanks, and they've got eight tanks yeah. in Piazza San Francesco where they're blasting away at all the German defensive positions. And so all this fighting is still going on, um, despite it being Christmas Day. The violence is not uh, uh, abating whatsoever. It's on Christmas Day where the Germans realize they're going to lose Ortona. <clears throat> First and 3rd Brigade are starting to advance west, uh, correction, they're west side of the town. They're starting to advance northwards, and it looks like they're going to threaten an isolation of the town. And so... The CBC's Matthew Halton, of course, is broadcasting live from Ortona, and he's talking about Little Stalingrad, you know, comparing it to that humongous, violent battle between the Germans and the Russians on, on the Eastern Front just a year before. And so <clears throat> there's a bit of an information, oper information operations campaign going on. Uh, but with 1st Brigade and 3rd Brigade making progress west of the city, we got 2 Brigade upping the violence and bringing more resources into the fight. <clears throat> the Germans are starting to realize they're going to lose Ortona and their props are going to have those two battalions of paratroopers surrounded and isolated in the city. Yep. The first brigade and third brigade are actually able to, to uh, make it to the North to isolate the city itself. So they decide they're going to uh, withdraw from the town, but they're going to make it look like they're not doing that. They're going to up the violence themselves to make it look like they're there to stay. Uh, they call it operation Ortona, ironically enough, and they let it go on the, they let it be known on the radio so that the Canadians can overhear it, <clears throat> that they're there to stay and we're going to fight the Canadians to the very, to the, to the end, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, they have every plan on pulling out in a couple of days. So the 26th of December, <clears throat> so the Germans enact their deception plan. They start blowing more buildings. They're calling in more close air support. They're calling in more artillery. They have more infiltration parties trying to sneak in behind the, the Canadians at nighttime, <clears throat> but there's continued fighting. The loyal ladies are able to get through Piazza Municipale and they're able to get up to Piazza Plebiscita. They, they get two tanks from the Three Rivers into the Piazza. The Germans have actually dismantled two anti-tank guns, re reassembled them on the second floors of a couple houses where they have a better view. And they destroy three of the Three Rivers Regiment tanks in the Piazza Plebiscita. So Jim Stone's got to suck back and then redo another attack. At 1,500 hours that day, Bombardier Doucette from New Brunswick is able to bring his anti-tank gun up, blow down the rubble pile that was blocking the, <clears throat> the piazza and start hammering away at the German positions. He wins a military medal for that as well. <clears throat> meanwhile, June, uh, correction, meanwhile, uh, Bill Longhurst and A Company, they're trying to fight their way into Piazza San Tommaso and B Company is more than happy watching the 17-pounders and the tanks continue to fire away along the Corso Umberto. Meanwhile, at Dead Horse Square, <clears throat> the Sea Force are able to finally fight their way through uh, Piazza San Francesco. <clears throat> two of the sections, there's two Sea Force sections that actually get captured prisoner. <clears throat> and Sid Thompson really lays on the violence, and he's able to free those two sections and bring them back into the fight. And then they're able to fight through the, through the Piazza and start working their way up via Monte Maiella. <clears throat> and they bring more tanks up as well in order to do that which is uh, absolutely fantastic. So you can see the violence is just increasing, increasing, increasing. I think by this point, um, the destruction of the town had been, had been so overwhelming and the loss of Canadian life had been so regretful. And the Canadians were so sufficiently angry enough as to the urban hell that they've been put through 
they're just willing to let overwhelming violence just to just be the main factor that decides this battle uh, once and for all. The 27th is going to be the last day of fighting um, for this uh, for this particular battle. The Canadians don't know that. Hoffy readies the Patricias and he's like, okay, Cammy. He talks to Cammy where the CEO. He's like, Cammy, we've heard about this Operation Ortona. We think the Germans are going to counterattack. They're bringing in more close air support. <clears throat> I'm going to let the loyal ladies and Steve Forrest fight for the town, finish, finish their fight. Then you and the Three Rivers Regiment, another squadron of tanks, are going to do a forward pass the lines through there and knock out this German counterattack that I think is coming. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the loyal ladies are able to clear the Piazza Plebiscita. Jim Jefferson lays down 11, 1100 uh, mortar rounds on the top of the, at the north end of the town. And meanwhile, the 17 pounder anti tank guns and the three reserve regiment tanks start blasting away at the tunnel entrance at the north end of the town because there's a rumor there's some big weapon system in there or the German counterattacks going to emerge out of the tunnel. Right. Bunny Allen's platoon is killed in action on this morning. Bunny Allen had taken over the platoon just the evening before on the 26th. He was inside of his platoon was inside of a house when the whole building implodes in the wee early morning hours of the 27th. And the entire building implodes. And it kills almost everybody in the entire platoon. And the, the loyal ladies are enraged. And Bill Longhurst, who had come up with the mouse only technique, decides to exact revenge by blowing two buildings that uh, the Germans are in. He's able to sneak his engineers and pioneers into the buildings. And they're able to wire the buildings with four and 25 pound explosive charges. And they blow and destroy two buildings to exact revenge. Sid Thompson out in the west with the sea force. He's pretty angry by now too. Um, the D Company on the north side of Via Montemayela <clears throat> is making good progress using the mouse only technique fighting top down. But C Company on the south side of the street, <clears throat> they run into a factory and the Germans are being very stubborn. They get a, they get a platoon into the basement, but they can't fight upwards. So Sid Thompson pulls his, pulls the C Company out, <clears throat> puts his pioneers and engineers in. They wire the building. They destroy the building with the Germans still inside of it. Building clear, let's carry on. And they were able to uh, walk up via Monte via Montemayella and they link up with the loyal ladies <clears throat> at the at the uh, at Piazza Plebiscita. So we're good to go there. <clears throat> there's a well, Charles Comfort calls it Piazza Plebiscito, uh, but there's a, there's a good painting of uh, the destruction of the town. On the 28th, scout platoon commanders, they, the loyal ladies in the Sea Force, they don't detect anything up north of them. And so on the 28th, the scout platoon commanders go forward and they can't find any Germans. The Germans have withdrawn through the evening of the 27th and into the morning of the 28th. They've pulled back and withdrawn all the way back up to the Riccio River. It's at that point the Patricias do a forward pass the lines with the Three Rivers Regiment. And they actually go northwards out of the town and they start bumping into German rear guards just southeast of uh, the Riccio River itself. But that pretty much ends... So the fighting really ends on the 27th and it's on the morning of the 28th when they discover the Germans have left the town. So that pretty much encompasses the battle. Are there any questions there, Brad, from you or the audience? Uh, that I could no, answer? no, well, actually, yeah, there's a few. Um, one was about uh, connecting back to the, uh, the use of the six pounders um, yeah. and about supply, asking if that, you know, I think you were talking about blasting um, when they're blasting the side streets with the rubble, just literally just hammering away. Yeah. Uh, it was asked about supply. And, and as we talked about, there's no tanks to face. So that leads to a more general question of how was the supply situation? I mean, you talked about the food and everything, but that's usually different than supplying with arms. Um, was there any supply difficulties because of the conditions? Uh, is that mentioned at all, really, in anything you've come across? <clears throat> Unfortunately, the, for my research for this battle, sustainment is not really talked about at all. Yeah. All I could find was that, th thankfully, the tankers from the Three Rivers Regiment, thankfully, they were bringing up ammunition in the morning. Like, they, what they would do is the Canadians would stop <clears throat> fighting at nighttime. They'd set out their observation posts to stop any German infiltration from coming in behind them. The tankers would withdraw back nice and safely so they couldn't be shot uh, or fired at by any German Panzerfausts. And then in the morning, the tankers would come back up into the front lines and bring all kinds of ammunition, grenades, yeah. and small arms with them. And that was the only thing I could find about sustainment. But generally, during urban my urban operations warfare research throughout the decades shows that you go about you go through about four times the amount of ammunition in urban operations because obviously concrete, stone, steel, brick, and glass are a lot harder than dirt, and so uh, are a lot harder to destroy than dirt. So 
and you need all you need about four times the amount of ammunition to um, destroy defensive positions. Now, the Loyal Eddies regimental history does talk about what they used in particular. They, mm. they used like each individual soldier had 10 to 15 grenades at the start of the day. Uh, they went through thousands and thousands of rounds of small arms ammunition. They went through 2000 rounds of uh, two inch mortar fire, the uh, two inch mortars. <clears throat> they went through 3000 rounds of three inch mortars. And I think, and the amount of explosives they went through was, was not, uh, was unknown because again, the, the engineers were picking up anti-tank teller mines and, and using those as well. Yeah. But, yeah. um, sustainment it was definitely i mean this battle showed just like every other urban officer operations battle the amount of ammunition you need is a lot and the canadians went through a lot of ammunition fighting this particular battle as a result cool uh we can keep going with the questions if you like sure why not yeah may as well um so uh, this one too i get a bit uh, confused as well because i've seen the footage myself uh about the soviets um because i know they have they have embedded within the eighth army um were they at ortona during, I don't think they were there during the fighting. I think they come after, right, to observe the city. Yeah, this was something I discussed with uh, Dr. Windsor when um, I was doing my, when after I had published my thesis. Um, there were Soviet observers throughout the whole Allied camp mm -hmm. um, during the Sicily Italian campaign and in Normandy <clears throat> as well. So uh, there's another conspiracy theory out there. That the whole reason we, we attacked Ortona was to impress impressed the Russians who were watching. Uh, I don't know how a brigade fight in, a, in an urban area, when you've got the entirety of the British 8th Army on the east and the American 7th Army on the west side of Italy fighting, I don't understand how attacking a small yeah. little town like Ortona is going to really impress the impress the Russians, right. especially when they've got millions on the eastern front. So, uh, yes, there were Russians there, but were they watching Ortona? Sure, they probably were. Uh, where were they at first Canadian Infantry Division headquarters or were they at British 8th Army headquarters? I have no idea. Yeah. <clears throat> they were probably reading the reports like everybody else in the fighting within the town. But it's yeah. not one of the reasons why, oh, well, we have to attack Artona because the Russians are watching. No. No. <laughs> uh, we have to attack Artona because it's, it's the eastern anchor point of the Gustav line. We have to break it. Yeah. It, it's the same as, as Diep, right? I think you hit the key there with the numbers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We can throw a whole division into the Soviets. That, that means. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> a division yeah, right. is, is nothing. That's right. Um, yeah, so that's just always because I've seen the videos of them. It's just again when they do videos, sometimes there's miscataloging or things are just wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yes, uh, about the air support. So you're mentioning German. Um, what were the Germans using for the close air support? Um, oh, their usual fighter bombers like the Folkwolfs and the Messerschmitts. Um, they were bringing in close air support and artillery. Um, artillery on the on the Canadians almost every day and every night, and that one, that only adds to the violence uh throughout this particular fight too uh, because um you know you just consistently canadian german artillery landing on both sides throughout the day and then even at nighttime as well <clears throat> but after the battle very smartly um actually it's here again in the um uh during the after the battle uh oh i don't have it here after the battle, uh, Hoppy very smartly brings up a bunch of air defense weapons because now the Germans know that the Canadians have taken Ortona. Yeah. And there's the defense positions. I found this in the Loyal Ladies War Diary, by the way, these two hand-drawn sketches. Oh, really? The one is the, uh, the two brigades defensive positions after the battle. Yeah. And then the one on the right is uh, about one or two weeks later after they shifted around a bit. But Hoffy, because the, uh, the Germans knew that our, the Canadians now taking Ortona, they start bringing in close air support. So uh, the brigade brings in air defense weapons, and they and they uh, are able to put them into the city, and they're actually able to destroy one of the one of the uh, fighter bombers that comes in to try to strafe the Canadians. And thankfully, no casualties occur uh, because of that close air support. But uh, once we were about two, three days into this fight, the Canadians were now urban veterans, and they knew get inside the buildings whenever you hear artillery or close air support coming in so it was really quite negligible uh the close air support because all it did was just create more rubble which made it harder to fight mm -hmm. for both sides okay was there an allied um air support as well or not a no not really mm -hmm. uh, it was mostly the germans uh mm -hmm. with their close air support again there was this belief that um no, we need to save the port as much as we can, so don't bomb it with close air support, even though we're days into the fight. And there are some Canadians who are like, where's our close air support? Uh, we're destroying this town anyway. The port's not going to be any good, but they yeah. uh, they held off on it, unfortunately. 
I remember I told you there, uh, Brad, about uh, Gordon Curry Smith of the Sea Force being buried yeah. for three days at that church. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'll cool. put that back up. San yeah. Francisco, yeah. Roy Boyd is of the Loyal Eddies. He's buried for three days underneath that uh, building yeah. in, in Piazza San Tommaso. And so finally he's able to croak out that he's alive and they're able to yeah, rescue him. And, and Gordon Curry Smith and Roy Boyd actually survived the battle in the war and they returned home to Canada. But uh, amazing, both those soldiers were trapped for three days under the rubble at, at Dead Horse Square at Piazza San Tommaso, respectively, and they, they survived, which I think is incredible. Going back to the Ortone Essay, you know, we destroyed most of the town, but we redeem ourselves there, Brad, to the Ortone Essay. This might give you a warm and fuzzy but in the, in the tummy, but um, uh, British 8th Army says Ortona is going to be a rest and recreation center. Yep. And so the Canadians for several weeks, if not months afterwards, they actually start rebuilding the town. And um, they start removing the rubble, demining booby traps. They start rebuilding structures, uh, cleaning up the houses, cleaning up polluted water wells. Um, because it's a rest and recreation, rest and recreation center, and start having bath and shower parades and film nights, medical inoculations, not just for the soldiers, but for the civilians as well. Yeah. And they start giving the civilians water, food, shelter, livestock and medical aid, paying civilians for services like laundry and tailoring and haircuts and, and dinners, etc. And so after several weeks, um, the Canadians redeem themselves in, for, in the eyes of the Ortonesi because we actually rebuilt the town. But it wasn't at a cost. Uh, um, Mark Zulke says that during the battle and afterwards, when they kept finding landmines and explosive devices, they um, over 1,300 civilians were killed as a result of this battle, both during and after the battle. Yeah. And the numbers for the Loyal Eddies and the three and the Sea Force and the three rivers, um, these come right from their regimental histories. So you can see the Loyal Eddies had 109 wounded, 63 killed. Sea Force 62 wounded, 41 killed. Three rivers supporting the all of First Canadian Infantry Division, including First Third Brigades, had 20 wounded, four killed. Numbers for the German Parachute Division are not solid. Uh, the Canadians found 100 German bodies in the streets. Yeah. So we figure that's probably the, the 205 missing in action there. But I think the numbers are actually quite higher. Yeah, that's all what I've been able to find as well. Is Because yeah. again, I did that video. Well, I had an older video that I removed um, quite a while ago. Um, yeah. For YouTube reasons, um, but uh, it was the same. I couldn't find anything solid uh, mm -hmm. about the German casualties um, for all kinds of reasons, um, that being one of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I was able to find, and it uh, squares with what I've found, uh, and particularly with the civilian casualties as well. Because yeah. I did some deep diving mm -hmm. on that, and that's the best I could do because uh, I felt that was important. Um, we can get back to a few more questions if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Please fire away. Uh, yeah, so um, we're going to get into a little more technical here. Um, and if you don't know, that's fine. Uh, but is there um, who, I guess, who actually had a higher ratio of firepower? In our tournament, if you know. Well, I, I would suggest it's the Canadians because the, the first Walshimauger division doesn't have tanks. They do have any tank guns, but they were few and far between. <clears throat> and they didn't use them. They couldn't use them extensively. So I would suggest the Canadians definitely had the firepower advantage because and this was good combined arms tactics, right? It was the tanks with the engineer. It was that symbiotic relationship of protection that you definitely need in all urban operations. So you have the infantry, the engineers, and the artillery protecting the tanks. And then you have the tanks protecting the infantry, the engineers, and the artillery as they're fighting their way through the city. And so, so you have, you have uh, troops of tanks and each troop is four tanks um, being attached to the loyal ladies and the sea force. You have all the engineers with all their explosive devices. You have the artillery, both indirect fire and direct fire from the six pounder and 17 pounder anti tank guns. <clears throat> and then you have the infantry, all their small arms and all their grenades. And I guess, and I would suggest that because the first Falschmiager division lacked the tanks and lacked the number of anti tank guns that the Canadians had, I'll suggest that the Canadians had the firepower advantage for this one. And rightfully so, because that is one of the reasons why they won the fight. Yeah. Um, so these next two questions, I, I assume they're essentially the same, is what are the lessons learned from Ortona that you teach your students? And then what are the key lessons from Ortona for modern urban combat? Wow, great. You. That's a great question. Well, so Two great questions from two great supporters, from Susan and Scott, great supporters of the channel. Well, thank you, Susan and Scott. And those are great questions. So let me just say this. Okay. So the Germans had a lot going for them, right? So they're, they're, they're paratroopers, so they're very professional, determined soldiers. 
they've had months and months of preparation with the Wehrmacht and the and the first false auger division right. <clears throat> preparing they've got the geography so that you know Ortona sits on that plateau they got the ravine the cliffs they've got the dense urban terrain on top of it so it's really a defender's dream yeah. they've got the element of surprise that you know yeah. it's it's part of the Gustav line the Canadians don't know that and they only need to commit small forces at a time they've got they can put most of their troops up in the tunnel to north end and then cycle companies through so what are the lessons learned and what and what are the lessons i teach my students how did the canadians win the improvisation of weapon systems okay tiger welsh didn't need to bring his his anti-tank guns in right. he brought those six and 17 pounder anti-tank guns in to blow away the rubble piles and to destroy german defensive positions the engineers using their explosives all those all those explosives i mean if the germans are being particularly stubborn the engineers would you know put 30 pounds of 808 plastic explosive on a chair on the main floor of a, of a building and then blow it. <clears throat> I'll suggest there's not much of a building to, to clear after you <laughs> ignite 30 pounds of plastic explosive, but, yeah. <clears throat> but, and then you have, that's again, the symbiotic relationship of, of protection, the tanks firing down range at defensive positions while the infantry engineers and artillery are working ahead to clear the buildings. So nothing could get at the tanks. So that symbiotic relationship of protection, which is here in Artona, you see it at Aachen in October 44. You see it at Berlin in 45. You see it at Seoul. You see it in Hue in 1968. You see the Second Battle of Fallujah in 2004. Yeah. Those good combined arms tactics are another important lessons learned that we take from Ortona that, that's forwarded. The mouse only technique, again, not invented by Canadians, but used by the Canadians so that they stay off the streets, <clears throat> prevents them from having to enter houses on the from on the main on the main floor through the doors and the windows taking the initiative away and finally just determination grit and pure and utter rage the canadians were so angry and they haven't put through this urban hell that they just upped the violence in order to destroy the german positions and to eventually take the town now in the 21st century we don't necessarily, we necessarily can't use overwhelming violence to do that because we're the good guys and we need to take that into account but when you get into like the battle of mosul in 2017 <clears throat> i mean sometimes overwhelming violence is what's it's, it's gonna it's gonna destroy the town but it's what's gonna eventually make you the victor it's unfortunate but it's the reality of urban operations so i think those lessons learned there um and the ability to mitigate some of those lessons learned like if you can mitigate the amount of violence you're using with a good information operations campaign <clears throat> then those some of the lessons learned that that we can apply at Ortona. <clears throat> One of the other lessons learned too is the ability to isolate a town or a city. If you can isolate the town or the city <clears throat> and cut the bad guys off from the reinforcements and resupply, you shorten yeah. the battle. The Canadians couldn't do that because of the ravine and the cliffs, and they had a hard fight. <clears throat> the, the paratroopers did not make it easy for them. <clears throat> for 1st and 3rd Brigade, they had a really tough fight west of the town. Yes. Because... Um, the Germans realized, well, if they isolate the town, those two battalions of paratroopers inside the town are doomed. <clears throat> so isolating the town is extremely, extremely important. Yeah, sorry, I'll just give you a break there. I think that that's uh, the key point. And uh, as we've already said, the gully and, you know, the jump from the morrow get tons of attention. Um, but again, I think that, that that left hook is another area that doesn't quite get fully, I think, understood is probably the best way to say it because of... Yeah exactly what you're talking about that's the idea right and that's what forces them to with the germans to withdraw in the first place um, yeah. but that is a difficult part to do right because that's it comes up again this is can we kind of sneak in our historiography here as we do especially in the odd channel is is why these things get talked about and, and one of the questions of ortona is why ortona in the first place and and, and that's part and parcel of all of this right and but who know what and when is a big part of it um it's it just it, it's a massive part that i've done all this digging i've done over the mm -hmm. last, I don't know how long it has been now, because I keep some keep coming back to Ortona. It keeps coming back. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's just it's a really interesting way to think about it. But why these things happen the way they do, and, and using different sources is, I think, a great way to look at it. Um, so, just one more question. I think unless people have other ones, if you guys have questions, we can probably do one or two more. But this one's an interesting one. I'm interested in myself. So, other than you know the war diaries and other accounts they may have found, have you found any other interesting primary sources on this? Stuff? It was just the, I really relied on the war diaries and the regimental histories and the official history from Colonel Nicholson, because Colonel Nicholson, of course, his official history is like the basis of everything. And, you know, all historians launch yeah. from there. Yeah. <clears throat> what I did find, though, what I found unique was that 
I have to be very careful here. I have to be very diplomatic. What I found is that there were certain <laughs> military historians who demonstrated that they had very little knowledge about urban warfare and yeah. that, um, or maybe, and, or maybe they didn't have time in the service themselves. And so they would question why certain decisions were being made. Right. And I would look at that and, you know, I would look at the war diary or the regimental history or Colonel Nicholson's history or the secondary stories, the secondary sources and, you know, the historian, well, why did this happen? I don't know. Well, why did the German the Germans, well, there's no reason why the Germans could have defended Ortona. And I'm like, there's a perfect reason. It's an, it's a dense urban terrain on top of a plateau. That's, yeah, exactly. that's perfect for a paratrooper unit. Um, but it was largely the war diaries and the regimental histories and the official history, which were my primary resources to use. <clears throat> the great thing now is that Dr. Windsor and I have written another chapter to this story because uh, Lee was able to find the military intelligence logs and the communications logs right. with the Library of Archives Canada. And so now we've added to this story by writing another chapter that's coming out in another book written by a British gentleman that even delves more into the Battle of Ratona and why some of the decisions and the causes and effects were being done. And that mm -hmm. chapter we just finished about a couple months ago and the Gregory, uh, the gentleman over in Great Britain who's putting this uh, book together on urban warfare history. Is, has received that chapter. And so um, those are some of the other primary resources that we uh, found were quite valuable after I had written my thesis. <laughs> As it always happens, right? Yeah, of course. Um, you're always finding the good stuff as soon as you're done or as soon as you yeah, get that button, something pops up in your face. Um, well, even today, Brad, I mean, on the Twitter there, um, James uh, Lebrun uh, yeah. had, a, had a photo about, you know, with a Seaforth giving some medical aid or some water to a German prisoner of war at the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople. Yeah, that's I've never one. seen that photo before. That's and new. I said to James, where do you find that? Oh, Library yeah. Archives Canada. So there's new stuff going on all the time, yeah. especially yeah. this week. I'm seeing people putting all kinds of stuff out of Artona, which oh, is yeah. fantastic. They're, they're, you are, and, they're you digitizing. And of, going oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. You you and a lot of other people are putting stuff up on I've never seen before. And I think it's absolutely, absolutely wonderful that there's yeah. more resources coming out. So. Yeah, it's the thing people say we're, World War II is done, studied, and I disagree. No, not yeah, at all. Like, that it's not even close to that. No, I'm right with you. You're preaching to the choir, brother. Yeah. Um, okay, so just last one, actually, and it's uh, kind of outside the realm, but I know there is museums in Ortona. There's one. Uh, it's, I think it's a municipal museum. Have, have, is, you, yes. have, you, have you visited? <laughs> I have not. I have not visited that museum, but uh, – Lee Windsor has, and he says it's absolutely fantastic. They've done a wonderful job. <clears throat> they have a hyper-realistic three-dimensional three model of the entire town as it was in 1943. So you can actually walk around. It's a very sizable table of the town itself. But apparently it's an absolutely fantastic museum, and they've done such a wonderful job uh, with photos and, and relics and other antiquities that they found uh, during the battle. And... Uh, so that the uh, that museum does exist in Ortona, and I w and uh, it's on the bucket list. I can tell you yeah. that. So mine too. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I haven't been lucky enough to go to Ortona generally at all, but that's definitely the museum is on the list. And I'm yeah. I usually when I go to the battlefields, I just want to go to the battlefields. But that's one of the museums I want to go to yes. because I've heard so many great things, and just because of the people yeah. that run it and are involved in it, apparently are just great. Um, are great. Oh, and they just reopened, and Dave would know because he's on the ball with all this stuff. So, uh, new location. So that's cool. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, the 40th Highlanders out of Toronto are looking to uh, send a party there for the 80th anniversary of the battle. Oh, really? And uh, very fortunately, I'm very good friends with the commanding officer, and uh, he's looking to see if I can join them oh, so awesome. that I can actually do a, like a, an actual tour while I'm there. Uh, which would be nice because the 48th, of course, part of First Brigade, they were fighting west of the town. Right? Yes. So they were they were supporting that whole whole that whole whole fight. Yeah. So I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, oh, we got someone asking about a regimental uh, about a list, but it's just it's just the list of the regiments that fought that you listed at the beginning of the presentation. That would be the reading list, basically, is those regimental histories if you can find yes. them. Yes. With the difficulty, um, even just lower, like from a library, it's just they're not as accessible as they used to be. Um, they're in locations that are like Ottawa, but not really elsewhere, as I've come to understand it. Um, but uh, that would be the reading list to that. The order of battle you put at the beginning of the presentation would be a good place to pull the names from and get there. But again, I just know generally Italian histories are not the easiest to find anymore. Yeah. Um, I, things like Brad, that. I, I brought up my, um, I brought up uh, a, 
page there. Can you see my? Uh, yeah, one second. I'll pop you back up here. Uh, so if you go on, if you go into Google and you type in Urban Battle over Tona Drew University of Brunswick, my thesis does come up. Oh, perfect. And uh, if you go obviously to the bibliography, you're going to see all kinds of primary and, and secondary resources there. So I encourage you to do that. And there's my other Artona work that I've done um, that's online at the moment as well. I do a two hour presentation for YouTube for the Fredericton Historical Society. So you'll get a lot more detail um, than you would find in this particular presentation I've done here because uh, obviously we're we're very uh, cognizant of time. So yeah, and I've course. done uh, a case study in a podcast with my American urban operations brother from another mother, John Spencer. As well, awesome. so, yeah. um, well, what I'll do is um, send me some links and I'll put them in the description once uh, you send oh, yeah, those out and I'll drop those in. Um, yeah. Another thing I was going to say, oh, <laughs> about the uh, finding the books, uh, wife's the librarian. So there you go. That's going to give you a <laughs> leg up in that search. Probably through <laughs> your library loan is probably your best bet, to be honest. At this day, <laughs> I don't know how else you're going to do it, to be honest. Um, and I live in Ottawa and it's difficult and they're all here. Uh, anyway, so yeah, lots of good talk going on. Everyone is uh, enjoying the presentation. So thanks for coming on. Uh, greatly appreciated. All right, I'm just going to do a quick uh, sign off uh, just by myself, just to kind of wrap up and then uh, we'll sign off together. Sound good? Well, thanks, Brad, for having me here. And I hope everybody was able to uh, to uh, enjoy uh, enjoy that presentation. I hope you did too. I hope you learned uh, oh, yeah. a couple always, things as always well. Do. Sorry, I was very quiet on this one because I just I was taking it in. Um, just details that I've missed in the past. Just great to have uh, uh, to hear it. So, anyway, I'm just going to do a quick sign off, okay? Okay. Just by myself here while I've got my attentive <clears throat> audience. <laughs> Uh, so thanks everyone for watching. I uh, really appreciate everyone coming out uh, for Jason and, and Ortona, uh, a battle that has obviously interested me for quite some time and uh, based on the numbers you guys as well. So thanks everyone for watching. Uh, for those of you who are patrons, uh, thank you again very much, especially the holiday season year end coming up. I, I appreciate it. Uh, there's a post on there. If you are a patron, please do check it out. Uh, it's got some questions and stuff. I'd just like you to take a, to take a gander at it. If you can answer them, that would be greatly appreciated. Help me get some ideas for what I want to do. Uh, for ODD for uh, 2023, um, might be doing some changes and I just want to get uh, some ideas from people. So if you are a patron as well, please do sign up. It does help me uh, a little bit uh, a month a month is a great help for me to keep this going because uh, without it, I can't. So um, having patron help is, is hugely important. Everything is linked below. Uh, and you can also become a YouTube channel member. Uh, same idea, same benefits, that kind of thing. Uh, check that out. You get insider information just like with uh, with Patreon. So check those out. But if you already are a patron, check out the uh, the post on there. Uh, it's from yesterday uh, about uh, checking in for kind of a 2022 wrap up uh, questions. So thanks for coming on. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it wasn't too bad with being ill there. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, I'm on the I'm just getting rid of my COVID uh, yeah. symptoms. So. Uh... I apologize there that uh, uh, it made my voice extra sultry and deep, but um, uh, <laughs> I, I do apologize you. that uh, <laughs> my my COVID fever and, and cough seems to be uh, yeah seem to come out a bit, but uh, I tried to power through it. Yeah, and we'll let you go now. We're both uh, coming off uh, illnesses, so I think we've talked enough for today, and we can just sign off and relax. I hope for the rest of the day. So everyone, thanks again for coming out, um, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'll keep everyone up to date with what's going up in the. Uh, in the new year. For other than that, everyone have a good holidays and I'll uh, see you in 2023. Bye, everybody. Happy, all Happy holidays, everybody.